Hi, I'm Mary, and today I'm going to show you the Fairlight page in DaVinci Resolve 17. So let's get started. Here on the Fairlight page, you'll see running across the top, I'll mute my playback, and you will see these are our meters where you can check out the monitoring panel. You can see your control room levels, your loudness, and you can even see a viewer of your playback as you're working. Across the right side, you will see your mixer, which will always show you all of your channel strips and your main outputs. And then in the middle, this is the timeline, and this is where you'll have all of your tracks and your clips, and this is where you can do a lot of your work. Now, right now, I only have a single clip in here, and this is actually the finished stereo mix from a short film called um, Hyperlight. And as I play this back, you'll notice that just using the space bar will start and stop your playback, as you would with most applications. I'll go ahead and unmute that. Um, other things you might want to do for navigation, you'll see right here in the middle. Let me zoom in so you can see that a little better. These are transport controls, so you have your play and stop if you wanted to use those instead. You would have them just as you would expect. And we also have shortcuts that you can use um, for navigation as well. So you can go to the home position by just pressing the home key will always take you to the first frame and the end key will take you to the last frame of your clip. So that's really easy navigation as well. A couple of things to um, think about as you're working on the Fairlight page is if you select a track, you'll notice that the clip beneath the track will always highlight. That shows you which track, which clip you're working with, and that comes in really handy when you start doing some editing and things like that. So one of the things you always want to pay attention to is where is your playhead and what happens to be selected. And luckily, there's a lot of visual clues to help you figure that out as you go. So if you look over here, like I said, I've got this track selected, and I can tell the clip has been selected underneath it. If I deselect the track, the clip is still beneath the playhead, and I can just find where the playhead is that way as well. Also, if I manually select a clip, which I'll do it right now, you'll notice it gets a red outline. And what that shows you is this clip is also selected. So there's several different ways that you can tell which things have been selected at any time, or if I click in an empty space, it's deselected. Now, which clips are selected or which tracks are selected come in really handy when you start doing using shortcuts and also doing um, editing, cut, copy, paste, that sort of things. It's very important to know where you are and what happens to be selected, and I'll bring that up again when we get closer to it. Now, one other thing that we should do as you're getting to know the interface is how to zoom and move yourself around manually. So if I wanted to, I could just drag my playhead across the clips, as you can see, and when I do that, I can hear it. That's scrubbing back and forth just by dragging. I can also click anywhere in this ruler to move my playhead to that position. Whenever I move my playhead to a position, you'll notice that the time code in the upper left will update to show me exactly what the time code is at the point where my playhead is, as you can see. And you can even change this ruler if you need to work in different increments. And all you need to do for that is just right click in this time code display area and you can choose to include subframes or even samples if you like. And if you're working in only samples or if you're working in film and you need to show feet and frames, you can also do that here. Just go down to where it says, you know, feet and frames and now I'm looking at it that way. I'm gonna switch it back just to standard, just by using the right click, right mouse button, I can go back and change that. Now contextual menus are really handy when you're working in the Fairlight page and any of the pages in DaVinci Resolve. So you will see me mentioning that quite a bit where I talk about right clicking. And that's just to bring up those contextual menus, which you'll see depending on where I click, I'm gonna get a different menu and different options. And so that's just another way to access different things as you go. I'm gonna deselect this track right now and just press the home key to move to the beginning and again, end key to get to the end. So that is just the very basics of working with one clip. Now let's take this a little bit further. Um, obviously, if we were to play through this, you'll hear that this is the entire mix of this scene, but I'm gonna switch to a different timeline. And in order to do that, we have several ways you could. You could go to this shortcut menu right here. And if I click on this, this will give me a list of some of my different recent timelines that I've worked with. Another option that you have is we could go over to the media pool 
And the media pool is where you can access all of your media, as the name suggests, and also your timelines. I happen to have a bin right here, and this is the list of all the different timelines that we'll be using for this tutorial. So right now we were just in the starting timeline, which was a single clip. Let's fast forward to um, take our scene a little bit further, and I'm going to show you the stems. So go ahead to the next timeline, and I'm going to hide my media pool again. And in this timeline, the difference is this has broken up the soundtrack into its constituent parts. These are your stems, because every soundtrack all comes down to three elements. You have your, whenever you're working your soundtrack, you have your dialogue, you have your music, and you have your sound effects. And all three of those things need to be separated so that you can um, deliver those because that's part of your deliverables, but also for localization to other languages, they may need to change the music or most likely change the language. And so being able to pull those um, elements out is an important part of the mixing process. And so just, this is just an introduction to how those stems work. And it's also an opportunity to show you a few of the other features for working with your sound. So I'm going to come back into um, my scene right here, and I'm just going to hit Shift Z, which is a default um, shortcut which will zoom all of your tracks so that they fit the window, as you can see, horizontally, which is nice. Now, I'm going to talk about selective playback for a minute, because when it comes to selective playback, right now I have my stereo mix, which is up at the top, plus the VO stem, and that is my voice stem or dialogue. I have my SFX, which is my um, sound effects stem, and then the music stem down below. And it's those three parts that are really um, combined to create our mix. So if the thing is, if I start playback right now, just by starting playback, you'll notice that I'm hearing all of them at the same time. And that's not exactly what I want. If I only want to hear one of those tracks, just press right here. This is the solo button. And that will isolate that track so that's the only one that we hear during playback. And now we're hearing the actual stereo mix. Now, one of the things you'll notice as we see this, let me stop that for a second. I'm also going to dim my playback so it's not quite as loud. Over here in the top right, you'll notice that we have these monitoring controls. And what those do is, those are your listening levels. So I can instantly mute or I can adjust the levels, and I can also dim. Let me just zoom in on that so you can see that a little bit better. And as you can see, there's my dim. That will knock it down by 15 decibels, and you'll notice that it turns yellow to show me that it has been dimmed. Anytime I press that again, it will put it back to whatever listening level I had before. So again, dimming the levels, or you can also mute. But that's your entire playback. And in this case, I just want to solo this one track. And I wouldn't mind making this a little bit bigger. And when it comes to making your tracks a little bit taller, you can just manually grab one track and make that larger or smaller, as you can see. If a track is selected, you can also zoom horizontally on that or vertically very easily. Um, right here is the vertical zoom slider. And as you can see, I can make this larger or smaller. You know, that's basically changing the height. And when it's selected, it makes it really easy to see that waveform inside of that particular track. So these are just kind of getting to know the interface a little bit. Um, now, something else you'll notice that um, if I deselect the track, that there is actually an outline on that waveform. And that is one of our timeline view options. That would be right up here. And this is just lets you choose different ways to um, view things. So as you notice that if I click on that menu, this will give me a few other options that I can choose. For example, this turns that border on and off. So I can choose to include the border or I could turn that off at any time. Um, I'll actually turn it off right now. And there's some other things that I will also show you as we go through this tutorial. So anytime you want to close that menu, just click off of it and it'll go away. And again, that was the timeline options, uh, timeline view options menu, which is right next to your vertical and horizontal sliders. So let me zoom back out. And so as you can see, now I can see my waveforms without um, the outline, and I could play those through. So this is my stereo mix, and we have the solo button, as I mentioned, but we also have mute. As you can see, you're, everybody's familiar with mute. And so if at any time I don't want to hear a track, I can also click those to mute all of the other tracks, or 
We can also swipe those by just swiping across the mute buttons or the solo buttons. So during playback at any time, I can choose which elements I want to listen to, and I'm going to do that right now. So I'm going to turn off my dim. I'm going to start early on, and I'll start by just listening to the stereo mix, and I will mute these. Notice I just swipe those on. I can start playback. Then I can switch that off and just listen to my voice. This would be just the voiceover track. If I mute this one. If I solo this, everything else goes off and now I only hear the dialogue. Are you sure? Positive, do it. So you can slowly decide which things you want at any time. And so that's just giving you control of your playback. So again, just a nice way to not only understand the different elements that go to make up the soundtrack, but also ways that you can isolate which things you want to listen to at any given time. So that would be looking at your different stems. And it's always um, helpful when you're learning the mixing process and you're working on different tracks is to understand, you know, listen to just the sound effects or listen to just the dialogue and kind of feel how they all work together. Let's go on to the next timeline. We're going to kind of take this to the next step, and I'm going to show you some another thing that we really have to work with to get to the final soundtrack, which you were listening to those final stems, is we have to start with our production dialogue. So let's go over to before and after dialogue, because this will give you a nice idea of where we started. So if you look, this is the exact same scene, um, but this, the sound we're listening to now, this is the actual um, the raw footage, and as you can see, this is going to be the scene without any embellishments. None of the extra work has been done. This is just how it was on the set. I'm going to actually zoom in a little bit so we can um, see this a little bit better, this section, just using my horizontal zoom. Now, one of the things to think about when you're using your horizontal zoom is it's always going to be based on the playhead position. So my playhead's at the beginning, so it's zooming around that spot. And if I were to play a little bit of this... Wait, where am I? You'll hear this just, that's the talking. And in this scene, we have Emiliana, who is our main character, and then she has a talking computer, because as you know, in space, all computers talk. And there's a talking computer that is um, helps them out, and that is Ada, so she is a second character. Right now, this is um, the production sound, and so what you're hearing is someone feeding the lines for Ada, which will then be replaced later on. And in fact, we'll be doing some work with the Ada voice and some of that incarnation in a few minutes. So, but what you'll hear is just the way it was recorded and the different voice that was feeding those lines. So, his power reserves are critical. Once his oxygen streams out, he will die. So as you can see, not the most exciting thing, but the editors had enough footage and sound to be able to cut the scene together and move on to audio post. And I'm going to zoom out a little bit here. And I'm going to move to the next section. So what we have next, so you can see kind of this before and after and get a feel for how this works, is the next shot down is this is going to be the scene. So we went from the footage without all of the visual effects to now the visual effects have been done and this is what the sound um, the finished sound, same scene. You are in orbit of planet Q-465b. What about Philip? Philip's cryopod has lost power. Now one of the things you can do now with DaVinci Resolve 17 is at any time you can just press the P key, or instead of pressing P, if you'd rather, you can come over here to the workspace menu and go down to where it says Fairlight Viewer. Um, and this is where you can make undock your viewer if you would like, or you can go up to um, the viewer mode and choose uh, cinema preview right here, the cinema viewer, and that would be um, command F if you're on a um, Mac or um, control F if you happen to be on a PC. And so what that will do is it'll give you that full screen preview so that you can actually watch and listen at the same time. And that's just a single keystroke to get you to that. Okay. Also, by looking at our monitor, I can click the button in the lower right corner of the viewer, and I can just break this out as a floating viewer at any time. I can move it if I have a second uh, monitor. I can move it over to that, and I can resize as well. So that gives you a nice visual that you can work with as you go. Go ahead and dock that again. And if you want to dock it at any time, you just click the button in the top right of your viewer, and it goes right back. Now. Um, 
so you can hear this is the finished sound and then of course at the end I have both together so you can kind of do a little bit of a comparison. Now one of the nice things about um, that you might have noticed is this drone sound in the background. The drone is like the all-purpose filler, some sort of sound that just kind of help um, cover up a lot of the issues that may be going on with your soundtrack until you get to the point where you've done all the work. So when for starters, it's very common to have, you know, the editorial department will put in some kind of drone sound or background sounds or anything they can to kind of get us to that point. So <laughs> that's just helping sell the sound. But, um, you know, one of the things is you know, where do you get those sounds and how do you make those work? And if you're used to working with DaVinci Resolve for editing, then you may be um, comfortable with just doing basic, you know, video and audio editing. But over here on the Fairlight page, we have a couple of features that only work on this page. And I'll show you right now how you can bring in some additional clips if you want to and a couple of options you have. And let's just use this drone as the example. So over in the media pool, and as you can see, I still have my media pool showing, is instead of looking at the timelines, what I'm going to look at is um, the drone sounds. And over here I have a bin with a variety of drone sounds. Now when you want to listen to any of these clips, we have a preview player right here up at the top. And so if I were to select, this is ambient space drone number three. <laughs> if I select that and start playing, you'll hear that's the sound of that drone. It's kind of a low, you know, ambient space drone. Um, I have a couple of different options here. Then there's also a few of them that have a little bit of a musical element to them um, that's too much for this scene but might be useful for something else. So we have a variety of drones here to, to go through. There's a suspenseful drone. Um, again, maybe a little bit too much. Now you notice all I'm doing is selecting whichever one I want to work with and then just hitting the space bar to play. Of course, over here in the preview player, you also have, if you look, we also have our play button. Let me just change my framing here. There we go. You can see we have our play button and we also have stop as well um, if needed. And so one of the things you also have is the ability to change the way you view that waveform in here. So you can actually zoom out to maybe there's 1% where I see more of the waveform or I can zoom much further in um, if I need to see more detail. While you're looking at the preview player, one of the details you need to know is this bar running across the bottom, that always represents the entire clip. So this is similar to what you might see in the cut page where we have the upper timeline that always shows the entire timeline. Well, in this case, this bar here, oh, this is our scrubber bar, shows the entire clip. So that would be the first frame and that's the last frame. So wherever I happen to go, I always know where I am. I'm not going to worry about this waveform up here because that may not show me exactly where I am depending on what I'm, my zoom level at that time. Now, if we wanted to edit a few of these drone sounds in, I just want to point something out. Let's say we wanted to select three of them, three or four of them. Let's say we want drone one if I, or drone two. If I just want to drag that to the timeline, I could just grab it, drag it into the timeline. I can put it into the track, a track that's already existing, or I could put it into a track below my tracks, and it will automatically make, as you can see, a new track right there for me to work with, which is pretty cool. I'm going to actually undo that now, Command-Z and just do an undo. And instead of bringing in one, I'd like to bring in several at one time. So I want to change my um, the height here to give myself a little more real estate to look at. I could use this vertical zoom, as you can see. But another thing we have is we have a lot of functionality with a three button mouse. And so what I'm going to do instead is hold the shift key and just use that middle mouse wheel. And as you can see, shift and the middle mouse wheel will also do my vertical zoom, which is helpful. All right, so if I want to bring in a few of these drones at once is let's say I want to get the first one, uh, let's say drone two bed, plus I also want to get the low drone number one, and let's do, let's get another one. Let's do the space ambient drone, that sounds fun. And so that gives me three different drone sounds that I can work with. So if I want to bring those in, now if I manually drag them to an empty space, it will put all three next to each other in the same track. And I'm going to hit Shift-Z, and as you can see, there are all three of those now in the timeline ready to work with. But something that you can do here on the Fairlight page that's a little bit different, I'm going to undo that, just Command-Z, 
And by the way, if you ever want to undo, that's up here in the edit menu. There it is, undo. We even have an undo history in case you want to look at all the different changes you've made and pick and choose what you want to do from that history. Um, so the difference is I still have these selected. And again, I'm just selecting one, command selecting or control selecting if you're on a PC, um, the different ones that I want to work with. There's my three. And as I drag them over, instead of dropping them into one track, if you hold the command key, it will create new tracks for you for all of the clips. And if I release, notice that it just made me new tracks automatically, and each of them is now um, separated and ready to work with that way. So this is just a really useful way to grab a whole handful of clips that you know you want to work with and start building into your sound design or your sound effects or whatever it is. You can just drag them all in and by holding command or control, if you're on a Mac or PC, it will put them all individually on different tracks. I'm going to go ahead and undo that for now, but that's worth noting. Um, and so that you know, was the main thing with this particular timeline, was kind of showing you the um, evolution of the dialogue. Now, let's break this down a little further. I'm going back to the media pool timelines. And let's go in now to look at dialogue editing. So now it's our turn, okay? So seeing what we're trying to do, now let's actually look at what the workflow might be and how you would do it right here in the Fairlight page. First thing I want to do is hide the media pool. And this is the scene as, as it came from editorial. I'm going to hit Shift Z to fit that to the window. And one of the things you'll notice across the bottom is there's that drone again, right? It's, you're going to find that quite a bit. So if this is the scene, let's see what we actually have to work with. And one of the things is I don't really need all of this, these extra things here at the moment. I don't need my mixer right now, so I can hide that by just clicking this mixer across the top. You'll notice there's our toolbar. If I just click on Mixer, I can show and hide it anytime. Same thing with our meters. I'm just going to hide those as well. But I wanted to see the viewer. So let's go back, bring the meters up, and just click at the bottom so that we can bring out the viewer and then hide the meters. And that way I have them just like that. I can make this a little bit smaller if I wanted to. And then I have you know, the workspace or the setup that I want to use at this moment. Okay, um, again, I can mix adjustments as needed. So here's my scene, and across the top, all of the dialogue, and then we have this Ada test voice. Now, I will tell you that <laughs> this Ada test voice, who is supposed to be a computer, was actually made by a computer, which is great at, from an editorial standpoint to give you some timing, but obviously for licensing purposes and copyright and all of that, not such a good idea. So this will need to be re-recorded and replaced. And that's something we're going to do in just a minute, is replace it with another recording. So let me just play a little bit of this scene right here. I'm going to start at this spot and just start playback. Ada, identify the person in front of me. Emiliana Newton. Are you sure? Yes. You hear that voice? So that's great, <laughs> that uh, computer voice. But again, that computer voice is not one we can actually use. It was helpful for um, working with this. So I'm going to show you a few other features for um, how we can um, bring in another clip. We'll make ourselves a track. And then also, I want to hide this. We're going to mute that and hide it. So first thing is, I'm just going to go to the beginning of the timeline. And I'd like to make another track for a different piece of voiceover. So. Let's go to the media pool and find that piece of voiceover. And it's inside of the bin over here called voiceover. And I have two. One is the test, which is going to be the computer voice. It appears to be powered down. That we can't use. And then I have this scratch VO. Philip Maida. I can't. Which is one that was recorded right here in Fairlight. And that's the one that we're going to use for now. And then we'll process it and make some changes to it. So let's bring that into the timeline. Now, I could choose an exact spot for it. Um, or we could drag it into the timeline. I'm going to have us actually create a track. So just right click anywhere in this, um, in the track headers. And anytime you right click there, you can choose to add a track or add tracks. In this case, I'm just going to add a single track, a mono track. There we go. And it showed up at the bottom. So anytime you want to name a track, all you do is just double click on the header in the name field and then you can type it. So in this case, Ada. Scratch B-O. There we go. And this is where I'm going to place that sound. Now over here, I'm going to take it, and I just want to stick it somewhere in that timeline, in that track. So I'll just grab the clip, 
and drag it in. You'll get the entire clip. There it is. Okay. So that's a start. And I no longer need to be in my media pool. So again, hide it. It's always nice to keep as much real estate as you can when you need it. Also, I don't even need the viewer right now. So let's go ahead and hide that. Let's save, save our space for what we need. And in fact, speaking of hiding things, I don't really need much of anything. What we're really doing is we're going to chop this up this voiceover into individual pieces, and we are going to um, use it and put it in a position to replace these other clips. So one of the things to think about when you're doing your dialogue editing is what is the most efficient way to get in there and perform edits without having to overly mouse and drag and think about it. It should be very fluid and fast because you could be performing thousands of edits at a time as you're going through and doing your dialogue editing. So we're going to do all of that here in a very short amount of time, and I'll show you the Fairlight way of doing it using the same editing shortcuts that you might use on a word processor for cut, copy, and paste. You would do the exact same things right here. The important thing is paying attention to how you have your selection and your navigation, which I'll be showing you as well. So one of the things I noticed, though, is this came in from editorials. You notice that there's been some keyframes applied. I noticed that there's a little effects. It says right, sees right here there's a badge that shows that there's an effect on this. And one of the things I need to do is actually wipe off anything that anyone else may have done to these clips so that we're starting with them fresh, right? We want them to hear how they were actually recorded so we'll know what we can um, what we need to improve and that we'll be making those decisions. So for all of those assistant editors who spent a lot of time making this sound great, thank you. And now we want to just remove all of those attributes that are on those clips. So to do that, it's very simple. Just going to, we're still using our arrow tool. We've been in the same tool all along. Just click here at the beginning and just drag straight across all the way to the end. And what I've done is I've just selected all of the clips in that track. Okay. By doing that, I can then remove the attributes on all of those selected clips with a right click. Okay, So I go over here to the right click and choose Remove Attributes. Now what makes Remove Attributes, there it is, Remove Attributes, when you bring that up, you're going to get a separate window. Okay, There it is. And the Remove Attributes window, here you will see you can choose to remove volume, I can remove plugins or EQ. I'm just going to remove everything by checking that box. Click Apply, and now all of these are back to whatever they originally were. There's been no changes applied, and that's exactly what I need for this particular functionality. So now we're starting from scratch. We can also remove the attributes on this, these middle clips as well, just in case there's any applied to them. Just set those as well. And okay, now we're starting from scratch. The drone I'm not so worried about. We can leave that as is. Okay. And then the next thing I want to do is we know we do not need this voice but we want, I would like to set some markers to use for navigation to match up with those Ada voice clips in the test track. And so I'm going to show you a little trick to kind of make it easier to navigate. You can see that using the up and down arrows will let you automatically navigate from clip to clip, as you can see. And I can easily do that, and it will look at every single clip, and it will move me one at a time, up and down the timeline, one clip at a time. Well, if I eliminate all of the other clips except for the ones I want, then it will make it even easier for me. And so what we'll do is let's bring up our index, which is right here. This is a different window we haven't looked at, or a different panel. And if you bring up the index, the index is like an interactive list, but it's much more exciting than that. It actually is very useful when we're going in and out of that index often, sometimes for markers, sometimes to work with our tracks. And in this case, once you show the index, I want you to look at the tracks index. And here you'll see a list of all your tracks. It also shows your buses as well. And over here, you'll see the visibility of those tracks. So any track that I want to hide, I can just turn off this visibility by clicking that little eye, and you notice that it disappears from the timeline. It also disappears from the mixer, but guess what? It's still there. It's just hidden at this moment. Now, when you hide the visibility, it does not actually mute it or solo it. It's just hiding it. So if you actually don't want to hear it, you could also mute it at the same time. In this case, I just want to hide that. I also would like to hide the drone. And so now I only have these clips showing. That's pretty easy. And by the way, the tracks index is also where you can move tracks around if you like as well. So in fact, let's move a track. Let's take our Scratch VO. I'm going to bring back that drone for just a minute. And let's take this Scratch VO and just grab, just click anywhere on that bar right there. And I just want to move it up. 
So it's above the drone track. And as you can see, I just reordered those tracks by using the index. Now, hiding things. Let's hide that drone. And so now the only clips I'm seeing are these five plus that last one on the end. And now I can use those with my up and down arrows, as you can see, to quickly move up and down the timeline, which is helpful, right? Um, it's even going to get better. I'd like to set markers here. Now, the markers, it's just going to be a little, it's like a post-it note, right? I could put information in it. I can use the colors. It's something that I can draw attention to if I'm communicating with other team mem members at the same time. In this case, I just want to press M once, and that will set a marker. I'm going to zoom in a little bit. And the zoom shortcuts command and the equals or minus, or of course, I could use my horizontal zoom. And in this case, I've set a marker right there. I'll just leave it blue for the moment. And if I press the down arrow, it goes to the end of that clip and then the beginning of the next clip. I'll press, press M again. It's now marking that. And so I'm just going to walk down here and quickly set markers for each of these because these markers will give us something we can navigate to easily for when we start placing those other clips. So I'm just using that as a guide plus it's always nice to know how to set markers. Now, any of these markers, you can also add information. You can double click them. You can ch add colors or change the colors and um, give them names and so, so on. We'll work more with those later. Just showing that, I'm gonna hit Shift Z. So now I can see all of those different markers and I can use those to navigate with. Now, the interesting thing about markers is if you ever use hold the Shift key while using your up and down arrows, that's going to let you walk up and down the timeline from marker to marker. No matter how many tracks you have, no matter how many clips, your navigation will now only focus on the markers if you're holding the shift key. And so that's very useful as well. Now, what are we gonna do with this clip? Well, it's time for us to look at using another tool. I'd like to actually dice this up into smaller pieces and then move them. So that's a good opportunity for us to just see how that works and how the tools work here in the Fairlight page. Now, if you're familiar with the edit page, maybe you grab a blade tool and do things or you're using shortcuts. Here we can do that as well, but we'll use our playhead um, kind of as a guide as we go. And something else we're gonna leverage is we're gonna click and make sure we select that track because by selecting the track, Option and the middle mouse wheel will zoom horizontally and Shift and the middle mouse wheel will zoom vertically. And as you can see, I'm able to make this nice and big so I can really see it. And I wanna dice this up while I'm playing it, <laughs> which is a little um, exciting, right? So I could go in there and manually, um, let me go back to the beginning, I could go in there manually and just grab the scissor tool or it's the razor is what it really is. If I grab that razor tool, it's gonna cut whatever I have selected at the playhead position. Well, instead of using that, we could use a shortcut. And the shortcut is Command B for blade. And so, as long as this is selected, it will only cut that particular clip. Now, if I had other clips in the timeline, I'm gonna bring back my drone for just a minute so you can see. If I don't have anything selected and I press Command B, do you notice that it's going to slice everything? So that's going to split every single clip beneath the playhead, which is not what I want. So Command Z to undo that. I'm going to go back to the beginning. And that's where I was saying track selection actually does matter. And as you can see, we just did that. So I'm back at the beginning and my track is selected, which automatically selects the clip beneath our playhead on the selected track, which is great. And then as I play, I'm just gonna hit Command B every time I pass one of these phrases and that will chop it up and I can do that right on the fly. And so that's what I'm gonna do right now. So Ameliana Newton, yes. Split, Philip and I'm just Maida. hitting Command B. Philip Maida. I cannot explain this discrepancy. Earth date. There you go. And so right there on the fly, I could do that very quickly. And now I can move these into position as needed um, to those markers. And so a, a lot of different ways that we could have split those up. This just happened to be one of them. But like I said, it's very easy to work with these things on the fly. I'm gonna hide that drone track again, because I don't need it. And then if I wanna snap these into position, I could just drag them over to those marker positions if I wanted to. Let me zoom out a little bit more. And as I can see, there's that last marker and that's where I want this clip to go. So I'll just move this over there. It's in position, just using those markers as a guide so that I could have all of my other tracks showing and it will not interfere with me placing these tracks because, or these different clips in the track. And again, we can manually drag these clips wherever we need them to go 
from one marker to the next. Um, keep in mind as you zoom horizontally, it's always looking at what your, where your playhead is, not what happens to be selected. So I'd like to um, go ahead and take this clip here and zoom in a little bit. I'm gonna select that clip and I wanna move it into position so I can just manually drag that to a marker and line these up. And of course I have the other clips as a guide as well. You can even cut, copy, and paste these into position as well. So for example, I might as well show you how to do cut and paste, is if I were to select this clip, I could right click and choose cut. There it is, cut, or command X on a Mac, control X if you're on a PC. If I cut that, you notice that it just cut that clip. It gave me a ghost image of that clip. And why would I do that? Because now I can just navigate to the marker and when I get there, paste. Because anytime you cut something, it is remains um, connected in the same relationship to that playhead. So any movement of the playhead, the clipboard version goes with it. So I have cut that clip. I'm gonna use shift down arrow to walk my playhead down to where I want it to go and command V to paste. I'm gonna go back up, go back to where I was before, just using my up and down arrows, or go to the home position even. Notice I'm walking up and down between clips, just using up and down. That clip is selected, ready to go. Command X to cut it. Shift down arrow to get to my marker and paste, Command V. And so I can do this really, really quickly. Um, it's just getting to know the software. So again, with a selected track, this really works great. If I don't have that track selected, notice when I go over top of the clip, it is not selected, and therefore I have to actually physically go in there and click it. So be aware, selection helps, and that's one of the reasons we have that. This also works great on our consoles, like the one behind me, um, to show you, um, you can use then the jog wheel or the search dial to grab your clips and move them around really fluidly, just like we're doing here. So command X for this last one, moving it to the marker and paste, and I'm gonna go back to my home position, command X, and I'll move the last one and paste. And so I was able to cut those up and put them into position just using a few of the other features that we have in the Fairlight page that you may not use when you're working in picture editing um, or on the edit page. So now that I've put these into position, I no longer need this track, right? Ada's tracks, so I'm going to just mute that track and then let's hide it. I'm gonna come over here and I'm gonna hide that test track right there, the test voice. And so now when I play this back and I'll just start back here, the voice, the new voice should be replacing the one that I had there before. Let's Ada. just test it. And let's go ahead and bring up our meters so we can see. Identify the person in front of me. Ameliana Newton. Are you sure? Yes. Okay, and there it is. So, and by the way, that voiceover recording was done just right here in Fairlight using a microphone. So, um, very easy to do. That's a little bit of our cutting and pasting and navigation within a single track. Let's look at now taking it to the next step. When you are working with dialogue editing, the other key is you need to separate every single voice to their own track. Right now we have two tracks. One is general all-purpose dialogue, which is both Emiliana and Philip, and then we have our scratch voiceover below. So one of the things we have to do is add another track. Let's do that right here. Just right click on that dialogue track header, and I'm gonna choose add tracks, plural. And by doing that, I can pick and choose where I want that to go. And in this case, I want it to go below dialogue. I want it to be mono, because these are all mono, single channel, Mono track, so add track, and there it is. Okay, so now we have it right where we need it. Um, and that's where we're going to then move all of Philip's dialogue. We're gonna drop it down into his own track. We'll leave the top track for Emiliana. So, in fact, I'm gonna go ahead and name this one. There, this top track is Emiliana. And the second one down here. And by the way, another trick is if I am typing in the name of one track and then I'd like to name the track below, just press the tab key. It'll automatically select the track name below so I can type Philip then. There we go. So we now have the Philip track and the Emiliana track. And so now our, 
our job is to find all of the sound that belongs, or the dialogue that belongs to Philip, move it to his own track, and leave Emiliana on her own. And so very simple to do that. We're going to use the exact same kind of functionality we did before with cut and paste. The difference now is we're moving from track to track. And whether there's two characters in a room, or it's an interview between two people, or if it happens to be um, whatever it is, a, an ensemble cast sitting around a dinner table all talking at once, everybody gets their own track. And that way you can make sure that their voices sound excellent because they're going to get their own treatment. Um, they will all be all the work that you will do will be to make that voice sound awesome. So first thing I want to do is just let's just go to the beginning of this track. I'm um, just going to press the home key and as we walk ourselves down using the up and down arrow, each time we get, I get to a clip, if I need to move it, I basically need to drop it down to the lower track. Now I no longer need to see my index. Let's hide that so I have a little bit more room to work. And something else I'd like to do is um, when I'm working on this is um, make sure you can see your viewers so that you can see who's actually talking or making any noise or voicing um, any of the sounds so that we know that it belongs on their track. Now, um, as far as the navigation goes, again, I'm moving up and down to get from one clip to the next. And this first clip that has some sound on it, let's, let's start with the first one. Who's actually making this sound, if anybody? No one's actually making the sound, and as you can see, it's basically a dolly shot for Emiliana. So we're just going to leave this sound with her. Let's go to the next shot. That's Philip. So I think I'd like to move that down to Philip's track. And whenever you want to move clips between tracks, there's very easy navigation. And I can show you right where that is if you want. It's your track destinations in the timeline menu. If you go down here to where it says track destinations, audio, You'll see very simple shortcuts for that. It's going to be option right down here. It's option command and the number one for the track one, option command number two. It's basically those two keys next to your space bar are the ones that you'll use in order to um, select a specific track. You'll notice that you can also do the same thing for audio tracks. Those same keys plus the up and down arrows will also navigate your selection. Deselect the track and I'll just show you. If I hold down those option and command together, my down arrow, notice that I can move up and down between these tracks very easily. And that will make it super fast when I'm cutting and pasting. Also, because I'm using this, I won't accidentally move anything out of sync because it's just a direct move, it's, it's mouse free <laughs> movement that I'll be doing in order to um, get it where it needs to go. So if I want to move this down, I just, my playhead's over the clip already, just command X. Then I'm going to hit the shortcut, option command, and down arrow, it's in position. I'm going to paste with command V, and then I'm going to go right back up and go to the next clip. This one is also Philip, so command X, down, command V, and back up. Um, and let's move down. Next clip is... And by the way, when you're navigating, sometimes you don't even have to watch the entire thing, but um, you can also move faster or slower. Uh, you could use your J, K, and L keys, which you may use in editorial. Um, you can also use those here. Those three keys will allow you to move forward and back using J moves back, L moves forward. If you hold K and L together, you'll move in slow motion forward. K and J together move slow motion back. And of course, holding K and just tapping um, L and J will move a frame at a time. So it's just easy navigation, just in case you want to go through this a little quicker. Um, this happens to be uh, a, another Phillips shot. This is where he actually starts talking. So Command X, move that down, Command V to paste, back up. And I'm just going to tap my down arrow to get to that next shot. Now I believe, I'll zoom in a little bit, this is Emiliana. Are you sure? Nope, that's Philip too. So let's move that down. Command X, down, paste, back up. What's this one? Eight identified. Okay, so this one's actually Emiliana. It stays where it is. Identify the person on the map. Still Emiliana. Let's keep going. Eight, how's that possible? Okay, that's Philip. Command X, down, and paste, back up. As you can see, you can just roll through these. I can even do it in fast forward. Okay, this is still Philip, so Philip's going to need to go. And I believe that quite a few of these next clips are Philip. These next, most of the shots except for this last one are all Philips. And so one of the things we can do is we can also select them all at once. If I select all of those, 
If I drag across and select and hit Command X, I can grab all those at one time, move them down, get them to the right track, and paste. And so now I've just laid all those into the track, and we're just to the end. The last shot, this is actually Philip. I need to select that track first, cut and paste. So this is just one scene, but as you can see, you can get pretty fast in navigating and pasting and moving things around to do your dialogues editing very quickly. Um, one of the things I'd like to do is I'm going to break this floating window out and hide my meters. And I'd like to actually color these tracks to make them a little more identifiable. And so, you know, one of the things we could do here is let's just make this top track um, I could make this orange, and then Phillips track yellow. But what I'm doing is right clicking on the header and then going down to the color and choosing whichever color I want. Okay, so once you've split your dialogue, one of the things you need to do then is evaluate it and see how you did and also listen to it and see how it sounds in case there's any issues. This is your time to really focus on it and start coming up with your hit list of things you actually have to work on or areas that you need to go in and um, adjust the edit or trim or areas that might need some additional help. You know, as you're playing and listening and trying to focus on your clips, when your playhead gets to the end of the timeline, what does it do? Philip made it. It doesn't fall off the end of the world. It redraws itself and just shows up on the other side, which is a little bit jarring if you're trying to get into a zone and really listen to the sound and get a feel for what's going on. So one of the things you could do is you can actually fix the playhead, and then it will scroll underneath, which works really well. And so right here in the view options, you will see that your timeline view options, you have something right here that's the fixed playhead. And if you select that, what that will do is that will now fix it so that the timeline will now scroll underneath. Um, and let's say I want to find a particular spot and start playing, but notice that you can reposition it when you want to by grabbing the playhead, or you can actually move the, the timeline by grabbing the ruler if you want to scrub that. But I'm just going to play it from here and just show you this is how I can kind of look and watch I could even put this up in my meters if I wanted to and watch it up here and focus on my dialogue tracks and listening. Okay. The Hyperlight Core came out a few days ago. It came out of cryo and we've been trying to fix it since it happened. We went spacewalking. Okay, and right there I noticed there's an issue. So this is one of those things is as I hear it, I can find it, I can see it really easily, and I'm going to go ahead and fix that, or at least mark it. And so one of the things you can do is you notice that I had changed the clip, the track color a few times by just right-clicking on the track header. And when I right-click the track header, I can change the color. But you can also color clips. And if you do a clip color, that's going to... Um, take precedent over the track color, so that way it will stay there and you can have both as a guide. And so in this case, um, instead of changing the entire track, I'm going to change the color of this particular clip. So I'm just going to right-click on that. This is the one that has an issue, and I'm going to make it just green. So it'll stand out. It makes it a little bit easier for me to see that. I also, assuming I played through the entire scene and I've listened to everything, this is really something I want to work on first. So I'm going to go over here and turn off my fixed playhead, and I'm ready to start to work here. I'm going to just zoom in a little bit, and I could use my mouse to zoom, as you can see. Can zoom really easily with that middle mouse wheel, or I can command and use minus and equals to zoom in. But this is the area that I'm having a little bit of trouble with. This is where I heard that there was a problem, so now I'm going to try to fix this, just doing a little bit of trimming and uh, just trying to clean it up. One of the nice things about doing your cleanup is you notice that as you hover over the edges of the clip, you will see that you're, instead of just getting an arrow, I'm now getting something that is showing me that's a trim tool. And on the Fairlight page, if I click the end of this clip, it shows me the entire thing, all of the handles. And as you can see, I can very easily see that a word was cut off. I'm able to extend that and release. And now I have, you know, whatever was at the end of this clip, plus I have the beginning one. So it was very easy for me to trim that. At the end of this one, there's also an issue. I'll just play that. Walking. that. So he just has a partial word there. He's walking. That. By the way, did you see how I took my mouse and I walked all the way back here, clicked so that I could play something again? Well, we also have a shortcuts to be able to play again. Anytime you've played something, you just want to play the exact same thing again. It's the option to listen again, or Option L, Alt L if you're on a PC. And so I'll just hit Option 
L, and it will automatically walking. play that again. Yeah. Like just two hours ago. As many times as I want, option L. And it'll let me hear that. Now, another op option that we have when you want to listen to a particular area, instead of just using your playhead, we can also create a range. And you can do that by marking in and out points, or you can actually drag a range. And in this case, I'll drag a range using our range selection tool. Um, if I zoom in here, you'll see and we have a range tool and we also have an arrow tool. Up to now, we've been only using this selection arrow tool. But over here is our range tool. The shortcut is R. So A for the arrow tool and R for our range tool. Now, if I select the range tool, what that will do is that will allow me to select a range of anything I want to, just drag across it. Automatically, those elements are selected. I could actually delete them, cut, copy, paste, that sort of thing. But what else is nice is, do you see how it marks these in and out points here? It marked a range, and I can use that range for playback. And to play a range, if I just hit the space bar, it's just going to start moving the playhead from its position wherever it happens to be. But if I use option and the forward slash, which is directly above that option key, it will start walking. playback of just my range. And to take that one step further, if you look up here in the toolbar, up here in your transport controls, you will see that we have a loop button. If you turn that on, once that's engaged, then it will walking. loop that playback. You went spacewalking. Okay, and so then I can really hear what the issue happens to be. Now, once I'm done with my range and I've set it, I'll just press A to go back to my selection tool, and that way I won't be doing anything or, or changing my range. Because when you create a range, if I create a range and click off of that range anywhere else, it erases the range. So if I select a range and go back to my arrow, then I click anywhere, and that range does not go away until I clear it. It's only in and out points is really what's there. So if you want to clear those in and out points, you can go up here. Um, it's in the mark menu, clear in and out, or option X, and it'll clear those. So it's just getting used to marking things and switching between two different tools. I can still do my loop playback, option forward slash. And I can listen to this little area, and I realize that I, there's something in here I need to fix. And so what, as I look at it, there's a partial word there that I don't want. I'll just dial that back, and it's gone. Okay? So I can easily do that. I can even add little fades here if I need to, to or trim the, some of the breath sounds if I want to make it a little less obvious in any of these to kind of clean them up. So that's just some basics as far as the dialogue editing goes. I'm going to clear my range. Um, but other things that we have to worry about, once we have the trim, once we have adjusted this, and once everything is set up and it's like, okay, now what? What's the next step? I've got everybody on their own track, is the next thing you have to worry about is the levels. Everybody cares about the levels. And we really need to make sure that all of these levels are good. And, you know, if you need a guideline, we actually have meters everywhere that are telling always the same story. You want your dialogue look for the yellow, <laughs> yellow for dialogue. In fact, that's one of the reasons I use the yellow color often in the tracks, is the yellow is going to be a nice solid color. Now, obviously, there's more details than that, but I'm going to bring up my mixer. And as you can see, there'll be meters across the top. There's meters in the mixer, and there's even meters on every single track, and they're always showing you those levels. And so when the levels are lower, those are going to be green. Yellow is going to be right there near the middle, which is going to be the area that you really want your dialogue to be, somewhere between minus 10 and minus 15 dB. Um, and then, of course, if it gets a little bit too hot, anything that's getting too loud, that's going to start showing red. A little bit you can get away with. If it gets too loud, obviously that's going to be too much. And so I can look at these clips. Let's just look at Emiliana's, these two clips on her track. I'm soloing her track. Let's select her track, and I'm just going to zoom in on that a little bit so we can focus on these two clips right here. And let's just see what those levels look like. Now, I could play them. Watch your meters. Notice I have meters here and here and on the right. And as I play those, you can see that the levels are low. I can mute my playback, and I can scrub my playhead over that, and I can still see the levels are low. So how do I make those levels louder? A couple of ways I can do that. I can drag this bar up and down right there on the clip. I can deselect that track if you want. It makes it easier to see. I can drag that up and down. And remember, if you would like to see the outline on your waveforms, you can always go back in and turn that outline on. If you prefer to see an outline on them, you can easily do that. That was one of those options. 
And as I raise and lower these levels, notice it's showing me how much change I'm applying right there in the tooltip, as you can see. And so I'm just going to raise it up, but I can do that. And then if I scrub over it, notice that I'm still looking for it to be nice and yellow, just bringing it up. And now I can see that it's yellow. I'm going to turn this off and play it. Ada, identify the person I'm speaking with. Okay, and now I can hear it, and I can also see that those levels are in the yellow, which is what I was looking for, right? And so I did that one, but now I want to show you just something else that we can um, use as a guide. Now, I mentioned the levels that you're aiming for when you're working with your dialogue is going to be somewhere, um, and that the peak, the average, right, where that sound is going to sit is going to be somewhere between minus 10 and minus 15 and decibels, and that would be... Um, right here on these meters. And like I said, that's going to show up in the yellow. I'm going to hide my, I'll just resize these a little bit. Um, if I hide my monitoring panel, you can see this mixer a little bit better. And you can see that if I were to play this clip, now watch this, I want to select only that clip. I'll use the range tool, select that clip by clicking anywhere at the bottom of that clip, bottom half. And you notice it selected it and marked it so that I can do a loop playback of that Ada clip very easily. With. Option, forward, slash. Ada, Ada, identify the person I'm speaking with. Ada, identify the person I'm speaking with. And as you can see, it's right there in the yellow. And there's even, these are sticky meters, so that you're going to see that they have that, that bar across the top is showing you your peaks. But then you can also see the average level is that nice solid bit. And so I've got this right where I want it to go. It could even be maybe a hair lower, but I'm really, really close. And we also have additional things that we can use for this if we'd like to help us find these levels even easier. And so in addition to our meters, let's add a plugin. Okay, we haven't added a plugin yet. Um, let's go over to the effects library. Okay, you've seen the media pool, you've seen the index. Let's go to the effects library and this is where you can access all of the different effects that come with DaVinci Resolve. And in this case, these are our fair light effects right here our audio effects. Now, if you're working with DaVinci Resolve Studio and you have VSD effects or AU um, plugins on your system, you can also access those from here. In this case, these are all of the different plugins that come with um, Fairlight. And in this case, the one I'm looking for is, believe it or not, a meter. This is just something that's kind of handy. It's not going to change our sound, but it gives us something we can look at. And so just take this meter and you can put your plugins on clips. You can have unlimited plugins on a clip, or you can put them on the entire track, up to six. And so at this moment, we're going to put this on the Emiliana track by just dragging it from the effects library. There it is, the meter, and drag it right to her track header and release. And what that gave you is a little meter, as you can see. Now, this is a sample peak program level meter, and so that's going to give you the same kind of readout that what you're getting over here, and this will clearly show you what the level is of this clip. So if I start playing it, you'll see... Ada, identify the person I'm speaking with. Okay, it's showing me that the peak Ada, is right around minus 9, I'm speaking with. but the average is probably right about where I want it to be. But just in case, I'll take it down to us a little bit. I'll try it again. Ada, identify the person I'm speaking with. Okay, there it is. So now it's peaking Ada, at around minus the 11. The averages are still nice and yellow. Ada, identify the person I'm speaking with. Okay, so that's all working exactly the way I want it to. So that's great. And because I've added this plugin to a track, you'll notice that here in the mixer, you can see there's the plugin right there. You can see it right there. Um, I can even delete this if I wanted to. I don't. And if I were to close this so I don't see it anymore and I want to bring it back anytime, that interface, I just have to come over here to the mixer and I can just click this button right there, the controls, and it will automatically bring that back up. So very easy for me to work with that right there. Okay. So now that um, I've checked the levels on that particular clip, I'm going to bring this back up. Let's do one more. Um, as you can see, I want to adjust this one as well. Now, I'd go through and we'd have to adjust the levels on all of the clips, but now I can kind of eyeball them and get them close. Identify the person on the med lab. Okay, so both of these are right on, so I'm good there. Done with Emiliana's track, and then I would move on to the next track. Now, hers is fairly easy to work with. Phillips is a little bit more complicated. He has a lot more going on in his tracks, which is fine. But, you know, one of the things you have to think about is also adjusting levels when some of what they're saying is quieter and some of what they're saying is louder. You might need to actually have keyframes to change the level within a clip. And so I could do that right here. Let's look at this. Um, let's see which one of his pieces do I want to work with here? 
He's got a couple of good ones where he, you know, the levels change within the clip. Um, let's listen um, to his track. Now, I happen to have soloed Emiliano's track, so I need to solo his and unsolo this one so I can hear it. He came out of cryo, and we've been trying to fix it. Okay, so this is just, you know, basically him talking, so that's kind of expected. We have this one over here. What's happening in this one? You died. Okay, right there, he says something really important, but it's very, very low. He says, you died. So I'm going to bring that up a little bit. Let's listen. You died. Okay, we're going to definitely have to bring that up a little bit, but it's also very creaky. There's some sounds going in there, so we're going to have to deal with that. Um, let's go to the clip right after the green one here. I'll look at that a little bit more. I definitely see a lot of level differences here. So one of the things I'll do is I'll just add a keyframe to that or a couple of keyframes so I can bend it so that I can make the levels different from the beginning of the clip to the end of the clip. And to do that, simple to add a keyframe. You just hold the Option key or Alt key and click once. So this first section is a little low. Just two hours ago. And the sec second section is pretty hot, so I'm going to just basically option click and add two keyframes right there in the middle. As you can see, option clicking adds the keyframes. I can then grab the levels and make them higher or lower by using those, you know, to alternate, you know, how the sound works. So otherwise, I'm adjusting everything. So as you can see, I just raised that level a bit. Two hours ago, boom! There's this explosion, and it surrounded the whole ship. Okay, and so that allows me to kind of adjust the volume. And then you can also get in there and really massage those levels as much as you need to for different elements as you go. If I have these little peaks right here that seem to be a little bit too loud, I can also add keyframes again, option clicking to add those keyframes. And it doesn't matter whether the track is, the clip is selected or not. Once I've done that, I can use my arrow tool, it's fine. And notice that I can raise or lower just that one little section by using keyframes. And so that's very helpful for getting in there and massaging your levels and getting them just right. Your goal is to adjust the levels of the clips just like you might if you were doing color grading. You want to balance each clip. Um, same thing here. You want to balance each audio clip within the track so that the track stands alone when you go to do anything else with that. So that's just a little bit with the balancing of the levels. Now let's go down and look at one other thing we have. I need to turn the solo off on this track. Let's bring these back together. And I'm going to hide my effects library for now. We'll be using those again in just a minute. I will clear my play range. And I want to look at um, normalization because that's one other thing you can do. It's kind of like the auto white balance of um, volume levels, right? And instead, you're basically adjusting the peak levels on a particular clip. So I'm just going to go to the beginning of Ada's track. We'll zoom in a little bit. And her first clip. If I want to check the levels on that, one of the things I could do is just right click on that and choose Normalize Audio Level. And that lets me choose, there's my sample peak program. Notice the default is minus nine. Now, why would it be minus nine if we want all the sound to be between minus 10 and minus 15? Well, because nine is just above 10, right? And so if that's your peak, chances are the average is going to be sitting right where you want it. So nine's a pretty safe place to start, usually. So I'll leave it at minus nine. Uh, one thing I will mention is that our normalization also includes um, true peak, and you can also choose one of your loudness standards as well. In this case, we're just going to look at, we're balancing our clips, so we're just going to do the sample peak program and normalize. And that just barely adjusted that one. I'm going to randomly make these different just to show you that normalization will um, adjust no matter what levels those clips happen to be. I'm going to select all of these clips again. And this time I'm going to right click and choose normalize audio levels. And because I chose more than one clip, what that's going to allow me to do is I can look at them relatively. And if I adjust them relatively, what that's going to do is it's going to treat it as if it's one clip. And whatever the loudest peak is among all those clips, that's going to dictate how all of them move. Definitely don't want that here. So I'm going to go to independent. And if I choose independent and click normalize, it's now going to look at each one independently and balance them out perfectly. So these should all be right Amelia where they need to be in the yellow, good solid volume levels, and I'm ready to move on. You know, we've done our dialogue editing, we've made our adjustments, and we've pretty much set this up 
and got everything exactly the way we need it to move on to the next step, which would be a little bit more of repair. Sometimes we have things that we just can't fix them with what we have. For example, one of the things we can't fix very easily is this shot right here. I will zoom in. This will be the one on Philip's track. I'll just use my mouse to zoom in. And this one, unfortunately, is one of the most important lines of dialogue in the entire show, and it is very heavily, I'll bring up my meter so we can see it. And if you listen. You died. Okay, he says you died, but you hear all that weird creaking and stuff like that, it's totally distracting. And so one of the things I can do is go fishing through my other footage and find another take where he did the same thing and just replace it. And in doing so, I'm also gonna show a few other features that we have. And a couple of things are just really, really um, awesome for as you're building your tracks up and you're trying to align things, um, being able to overlap them and work within layers is really useful. So I'll show that right now. As you work, let's go in and um, what we'll do is I need to go up to the timeline menu and I wanna choose layered audio editing. So up until this point, we've been doing, um, the default would be to overwrite editing, which means if you drop a clip on top of another clip, it's gonna mark, put a hole in it basically. It's where the new clip is. If you remove the material, there's a space there where it used to be. If you do layered audio editing, they sit on top of each other in layers and become transparent as you drag them around so that you can actually overlap those waveforms and see them perfectly. It's a great way to work. So I'll show you that right now. Here is the clip that we need to adjust. And what I'll do is I'll drop the new one on Emiliana's track so we can work with it from there, uh, just to align it. Let's go into the media pool and I'll find the clip I want. It's down here where it says repair and replace. And there's only one clip. You notice I'm looking at things in list view. You can also look in icon view as well. And there I can see there's the scratch voiceover and I have this one right here, which is the clip I wanna work with. It's already been marked. This is the sound right here where he says you died. You died. Okay, that's what I want to do. Now, by the way, you can mark in and out points right here in the preview player by just marking I for in, O for out, just like you would on editorial, just like you can in the timeline as well. So I've got this marked and I want to place it right here in the track above. So I'm just going to drop it right there and then I can hide my media pool. And so now I have the clip sitting right there on top, roughly in the right place. I'll zoom in a little bit. And as you can see, it's the same line. You can totally tell that basically the same thing, one sitting on top of the other. Now, I'm gonna turn off my layered audio editing for a second. If I were to drag this on top, great, I just stuck it in that track. Notice it took on the track color. <laughs> um, actually, I'll change the clip color now to, um, let's go with navy, just so it stands out. But look what happened if I pull this back out. It punched a hole in there because it was in overwrite editing, our default mode. So instead, I'll just undo that. I'll still make it navy though, that looks good. There we go, and I'm gonna go up to, um, we're gonna just work our way right up here to the timeline and change it to layered audio editing mode. And by going to layered audio editing mode, now I can align it here as best I can. In fact, right here there's a little magnet as you can see, this is our snapping magnet. <laughs> that icon, let me just zoom in there. As you can see right there, it looks like a magnet. I can turn that on and off anytime if I need to. If I turn it off, it just allows me to move things a little freer. It's not gonna try to snap them to markers or clips. And then I'm gonna drop it right down on top of the other one. Look at that, I can absolutely see both waveforms at the exact same time and I can really line those up beautifully just like that. When I release that, I know those are in sync. I don't even have to look at those to know that I just line those up very nicely. And once it's sitting there, then I can always extend it and make it a little bit longer if I wanted to on either side. I can even add fades as you can with any clip by just dragging up at the top. Notice any clip you hover over, you can automatically add a fade. And as you can see, because it's sitting on top of another clip, it's actually doing a nice crossfade there to the clip beneath it. If I play this. You died. Okay, you can see that it's working perfectly. I'm gonna back that up, zoom out a little bit. And I'd like to show you what the layers look like. So if I go up here to the view menu, I can come down to where it says show audio track layers. It's in the view menu, it's just a way of viewing your timeline. And now you can actually see there's one clip sitting on top of the other clip inside of track layers, okay? They're both still there, it just, 
I never got rid of the first one. It's just got a clip sitting on top of it. I'll go back to the view menu and now turn that off. And as I said, I can extend this as much as I needed to and play it back. You died. Okay, and there it is. So those are just some of the things we can do to kind of re for repair. A couple of other things that might come in handy um, for fixing up your clips. So let's come over. I'm going to go into the media pool back to my timelines and I'm in list view and I'm actually going to go to a little bit further um, timeline. Um, these are all different progresses of progressive timelines of the things that we've been doing all along. And so now I'm down to the point where I'd like to show a little bit of repair. So I'm going to just double click on this particular timeline to open up. And this is outside of the main um, scene that we were working on. And here you're going to see just a couple of examples of issues that we run into where we can use our plugins to kind of do some repairs that you can't do with a mouse and keyboard. So let's go over to the media pool and I'm going to actually hide that. Don't need it. Make this fit a little bit better. This first clip has a very common issue. And in fact, I'm going to bring up the effects library so we can see that. Um, and the issue that we have is there's a hum in the background. In fact, if I play this, I play you may or may not, may not hear it. Um, if you can't hear it right now, I will make sure that you hear it by turning up the volume. <laughs> so I'm going to turn this up, but I will also mark an out point on that. So it's only going to play this little section. I marked O for out. And I'd like to zoom in on that a little bit. And I'm going to turn up the volume level by just cranking that up. By the way, you can use shortcuts to raise and lower the volume as well if the clip happens to be selected. And the shortcuts for those are in the time, uh, let's see, where are they? They are in the clip menu audio to increase or decrease levels if the clip is selected. So in this case, I just dragged that up. So now it's nice and loud and you'll hear there's that power line hum. You can hear it. That's a very common sound that you'll get. Um, if you ever plugged in an amplifier, you know what that sound is. That is a 60 hertz power line um, sound. I'm just going to put that back. Notice that when I raise the volume of a clip by just double clicking on that volume line, it does reset that level. Now, if I want to re remove that sound, I'm going to add a plugin to the clip itself. I don't have to add this to the to the mixer. In fact, I don't even need my mixer showing. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to come over here to my D Hummer and just drag that right onto the clip. As I mentioned, you can have unlimited plugins on a clip. So by just dropping that on there, now it's put the D Hummer right there on the clip. If I select the clip now, I can play that. I'm just going to play that section or I can do the entire clip. I'll get my range tool, select the entire clip and play the whole thing. The like hum work. is still there, and I can see it. It's a very healthy hum. But you notice that in our D Hummer interface, you will see that it has two presets. One's for, just zoom in on that. One is for 50 hertz, which would be if you were in Europe, um, and 60 hertz would be if you're in the U.S. So depending on where you live in the world, um, you're going to be either 50 or 60 hertz. And so we have a preset for both. I'm just going to hit 60 hertz to fix that. A few days ago. Play that and it should have cleaned it up pretty quickly. I can adjust the amount as needed. In fact, you could drag that amount all the way if you wanted to, and that's going to take all of that sound out and I'm then just kind of slowly it. back it off it as happen. needed. And if you're wondering what are these other areas, these notches that you're seeing, um, each of those, that's what's being reduced. That's the different frequencies that are being reduced. And if you notice, these are the harmonics. You just keep multiplying the initial sound. So 60 hertz, the next one would be 120, and then so on. That's where you're going to get those harmonics, and you might need to include those as you're working with your filtering, and that's why that's there. They all work together to kind of achieve our goal. And then once you're finished, we now have dealt with that particular noise, and it is better. Thank goodness, right? Now, one of the things that once you have added a plugin or multiple plugins to a clip, if you actually want to play it back without any processing, you can right click and choose to cache that audio effect. Notice right there. You can bounce it, which will actually bake it into a new clip. It'll render a new clip with the effects on it or just cache. And so I just clicked cache audio effect. You'll notice it now shows a little drive there. So, and this is the clip with the plugin cached. And you can like see it's or. much cleaner yeah. than it was before. If I right click, I can always uncheck the cache and then it will show it to me. It's still going to sound the same either way. It's just what I'm actually able to hear and, and um, see in my waveform, how it's reflecting it. 
Okay. One other thing while I've got this clip selected is let's go over to the inspector because the inspector will show you information about anything that you happen to have selected. And so in this case, if I, if I select this clip, it's showing me information about that particular clip, including the effects that have been applied to it. So all you have to do is click on that effects tab. And now you'll see that there's my dehummer plugin and I can actually open up the controls for that anytime by just going into the effects and I can set that up. I can even turn it on and off if I wanted to from here or back on the controls. I'm going to hide my inspector. And as you can see, this is with came out of cryo. and without We've been trying to fix it. the plugin. I'm going to go ahead and close that up. And so that's the first one. We finished that. Let's move over here. The last um, plugin that I want to show you, and then we're going to try one more thing. And that's actually applying what we just learned on a real world project is I'm going to go down to this lower track, select that clip with my range tool. So it's already marked it. And if I play any of this, what you're going to hear is this is a very scratchy sounding track. Ameliana Newton. Yes. Now, I don't know how well you could hear it. If I turn this up, you're going to see there's quite a bit of noise in there, but there's some kind of scratchiness to that that makes it completely unacceptable for playback. I could never turn this in. Philip Maida. Philip Maida. Do you hear all that noise back there? Now, this what we have is our noise reduction will actually help you um, reduce all different types of noise. In this case, we just want to get rid of this particular sound. What's in between the dialogue and then leave the dialogue. So the trick to that is I'm going to zoom in. And I'm going to set a range for just part of the clip, right? I don't need all of it. I just need some of it, a place where there's noise. So I just dragged a little range right there. I'm going to turn this way up so I can really hear it, right? And now if I listen, that's the noise I'm trying to avoid. Do you hear that? There's a lot of that little crackly sound in there. Now, obviously, you shouldn't have to turn it loud to hear it. But I just turned it way up to make sure that everybody heard what we we're dealing with. So let's use our noise reduction. I'm going to come down here to the noise reduction plugin, and I'm going to drop that right on the clip. Now, the noise reduction gives you two options for reducing noise. I can hide my effects library. The two options that we have for reducing noise, one of them is manual mode, which basically will learn a noise profile. You tell it what to learn, and that's what it removes, sort of like using a key when you're working with images, you know, remove this color. In this case, it's remove this sound profile. So to do that, just make sure you're in manual mode. And then I'm going to press this learn key and just play some of my noise. I'll turn it up a little louder just to make sure it gets a nice profile. As you can see that crackling noise, you see the white is the actual sound. The purple is what it's reading as the profile. And so if I turn off learn, that's what it's going to keep. So there you go. So that is the part that we have to work with. Um, and just make sure if you are playing looped playback and you have it cranked up really loud, just only play loop playback option forward slash. I'm going to double click on um, to reset those levels. And now that my noise profile is there, I can clear the range. And let's just play that clip and it should sound pretty good. Ameliana Newton. Yes. Philip Maida. So the noise is gone. Now, if I'm doing too much, if I'm taking out too much noise, I can always adjust my wet dry level. Dry means no effect has been applied and wet means fully applied. And anywhere in between is how much of the effect is going on to the clip. Now, as you can see, um, one of the things that we need to look at here is I want to try the auto mode because auto sounds so easy, right? Let's go ahead and select it and change it to now auto speech mode. And now what auto speech mode will do is it will um, listen automatically and it's going to find the voice and actually extract it from any other background noise. And so I just switched it over to auto speech mode. And as I play, notice First it will adjust automatically and just strip that sound out for me. So sometimes you need multiple plugins and sometimes you can get away with just one. Some, if something's really noisy, I might need to use two noise reductions. Maybe I'll do a noise print first manual and then add an auto mode. But that is how I can get this to work. So those are two examples of uh, some of our repair plugins. Just want to show you how to put some of these things together in a real world project because this is something that happens all the time. So let's come over here to the um, a different timeline. I'm going to use this repairs. This is a real 
clip from a real project. I'm actually going to go to the edit page for the first time and just click on the edit button. And as you can see, here I am on the edit page. As you can see, the, the trip to get from editorial to audio post in DaVinci Resolve is very fast, right? You click a single button, I'm already there in audio post. Well, this is what it, this particular clip looks like in editorial. And if I were on the edit page, and if I was the editor playing it, this is what an editor would see in their tool set. Visuals look great, but listen. So, with, uh, with a stir fry? Audio is not great. Um, and most of the sound is only coming out of one speaker and obviously there's a problem but it's not very obvious from here. Now let's go back to the Fairlight page. How do you switch to the Fairlight page? Of course just click the Fairlight button at the bottom of your screen and now we're on the Fairlight page. Now right away when you look at the Fairlight page we see all of the channels of a clip right there in the track and so as you can see this top track this is this looks like garbage. This particular upper channel here is barely any sound at all. It might have been a mic turned on, but there's clearly no usable sound in there. But it's being mixed with the good mic, right? Plus we're in a kitchen that has refrigerators and all kinds of other things, so who knows what all is creating the noise. So one of the first things we can do is we can just change the channel mapping of this so that instead of this being a stereo clip with two channels, let's just pare it down to the one channel we actually want. Channel le the left channel is one, the right channel that looks decent is channel two. So how do you change those attributes? Let me go to my arrow tool. Um, and just with your arrow tool, A for arrow, I'm just going to right click on that clip and choose clip attributes. And when you go to clip attributes, this shows me that it's stereo and it shows me both of my microphones. That just happens to be this clip. If it was a six channel clip, it would tell me it was a six channel clip and I'd see all those channels. So what I want to do is change it to mono so it's only a single channel but I don't want channel one, I only want channel two. There you go. So by making this channel two and making it mono, you notice that it'll just take it a second to redraw that. And now I should be able to hear this. Um, I should be able to hear it and now I'm only getting the single channel that I needed. Now I also want to change my um, audio. As you can see, this track is a stereo track and I really need it to be a um, mono track. So you can at any time change what type of track you're working with too by just right clicking the track header, going down to where it says change track type to mono. And now my track matches my clip and the clip I can actually see it pretty well. Now let's listen to just the good channel. And Hello. even listening Hello. to this, and today, oh, I'm gonna take you I can tell that this is very noisy. You hear all kinds of refrigerator sounds and things in the background. This is pretty noisy. So again, let's go in and use the two tools that we have and how easy that will be to work with, right? So as we're looking at repairs, one of the things I'll do is take my range tool and I'll just drag a little range right here of some of that noise. Okay, that'll work. Turn this up a little bit so I can really hear it. Don't be afraid because I just option forward slash. Okay, that's the noise. Okay, that's someone saying and as in, so I'll just change the endpoint of that. I marked a new endpoint. Nope, oh, still there. So let me just find a better slice here. Just when in doubt, make a new range. Okay, pure noise. <laughs> I can hear it. Now, I also hear a really high-pitched whine. Um, again, I think that's a refrigerator. So whenever I have both noise and some kind of hum, I'm going to go for the hum first. So I'm going to go in here to my close my media pool, get my effects library. Now, by the way, you don't have to close the media pool. You can have both at the same time. Media pool will then sit on top and the effects will sit at the bottom, which is fine. Um, in this case, I don't really need the media pool. And I'm going to go in here and I'm just going to go down and find, there's my dehummer. So I'm going to hit the noise first. I could apply it to the entire track or I could apply it to the clip. In this case, I'll just drop it right on the clip. There it is. Here's my dehummer. Now this is not power line hum. And again, I'm listening to this by hitting option forward slash. That is not power line hum. That's a really high pitched whiny sound. So first thing I'll do is I'm going to we could just sweep these frequencies by dragging frequency. I'm also going to make the amount really high and that way I know I'll hear it when that hum goes away or that hissy sound goes away. So I'm going to now walk downstream and just right there that high pitch whine feels like it's gone. 
Okay, that's what I was trying to accomplish. So now that the high pitch sound is gone, I'm also going to adjust my slope a little bit because the main part of his voice, the meat of his voice is going to be right in this section. And I'm thinking this is a very high pitch sound. It's probably right there around 400. So I'm going to change the slope just like that. So this swaps the position of the harmonics with the fundamental. And now I'm going to listen here. And that high pitch whine is gone. I could bring this amount back a little bit if I wanted to. But there. So that was the first problem solved. And then the second one, what I need to do is I need to come in here and now we want to do that noise reduction. Now I don't need a range for that. I'm going to just trust the noise reduction will work and drop it onto the clip. Also reset this and I'm going to set it to auto speech mode. And just like that, I'm going to hope that between the two of them. Hello, my name is Jamie and today I'm going to take you through a Chinese. So as you can see, that was putting together those different tools that we have shown you. Um, and in this case, just having those repairs ready to throw in there and adjust makes a really big difference. So whether it's one clip or a dialogue scene, having those uh, repair plugins ready to use is very helpful. So I have one last thing to show, um, and it's right here. Let's go back to the media pool, hide the effects library. And I'm going to show you when you can't use a plugin or when there's something that you just have to find a way to get rid of. Sometimes you have to go into the sample level to edit something. So the last example for this um, overview is going to be fixing a music cue. Now, if you've ever come across clicks and pops in your files, you'll notice that it doesn't matter if it's dialogue or music or whatever it is, you can't turn it in if it's got some kind of really um, loud pop that's going to make all the speakers pop. You know, that means you have to get in there and find a way to fix it. There may be some third party plugins that work. Sometimes they do, sometimes they don't. But you can go in there and just dial it right out on your waveform using just your arrow tool. And I'll show you how to do that right now. So I've opened up this music cue. And at the beginning of the music cue, there is a two pop, which is a single frame. As you can hear, that's a, just a one kilohertz tone, one frame of that for indicating that we are at the beginning of a scene or of a show that we're using that for sync. If I put my playhead over that and zoom in and, uh, and continue to zoom in, you'll see we can really get in there pretty far. Remember, left and right, that's one frame. And look at how far I've moved into my waveform. As I continue to zoom, I can get all the way down to the sample level. Once you start seeing these little boxes, you know you're looking at it at the sample level. Now, in this case, that's just a one kilohertz tone. Now we're going to go in there and find that issue, which happens to be at this red marker. So I can shift down arrow to the red marker, zoom in a little bit. And actually, let's play it. I want you to hear this. I'm just going to pull this back to the beginning, play this little piece of music. When you hear that pop, you'll see the meters flash and you'll know you're in trouble and that's what we have to fix. So let me just play it. Do you hear that? That is the sound we're trying to avoid. That's what we have to fix. That pop that also sends your meter spiking, and you've probably all heard that once before. So now that you've heard it, let's get rid of it. I put my playhead on that red marker, zooming in. This actually only takes a few seconds, believe it or not. So I'm just going to come over here, zoom in, and continue to zoom in. I just have to keep chasing it because we're zoomed in so far that we are nowhere near a frame. And so what I did was I just zoomed into it until I finally got to a point. Notice you can redraw it a few times going in and out using your zoom shortcuts till you get a space that you can actually work with. That looks pretty good. And so why I was doing that was this is the glitch. That's what it looks like at the sample level. And so if I want to dial that out, I can just select right here. I can select a sample, just kind of move my mouse, make that nice and smooth. And I'll come over here and do the same thing. It doesn't have to be perfect. Just want to align it with the ones that were there before. There you go. Shift Z, I'll zoom out and that glitch is gone. And if I were to play this, no sign of it now, just the percussion. And so that is working at the sample level. So thank you very much for watching this overview of the Fairlight page in DaVinci Resolve. If you have any further questions, you can visit the Blackmagic Design webpage to check it out. So thank you for watching.